All right, so I've been asked to talk about why Atlas Shrugged, I think, I believe, is it, such an important book. And there's so many things you can say about this topic. And, and I could do many hours of uh, presentation on why Atlas Shrugged uh, is important. Uh, but I, so I want to I specifically deal with two questions, kind of a, a personal, uh, at the personal level, why I think Atlas Shrugged is such an important book for, for particularly young people, but really everybody to read. And then at the political level, why I think it's so crucial from a political perspective, how Atlas Shrugged can help shape a society, help shape a political order in the right kind of way. And, and I'll just start with a personal story. How, I, how did I read Atlas Shrugged? So I don't know how much you know about me, probably not much, but uh, I was born and raised in Israel. And when I was 16, like almost every Israeli uh, in the mid-1970s, I was a committed socialist. I was a committed collectivist. I was a committed immorality altruist. So I was everything Ayn Rand was against. And a friend of mine handed me a copy of Atlas Shrugged. And it changed my life. It changed everything about my life. From my philosophical ideas to where I chose to live. I chose to live in the U.S., not in Israel. To what I landed up doing in life. It impacted everything. Because that's what philosophy does to you as an individual. Philosophy gives you a, the principles by which to live your life. And all of us have a philosophy, whether we know it or not. Whether we thought about it or not. We are all guided by a set of ideas. For most people, 90% of the people, unfortunately. That set of ideas is never thought out. It's never made clear. They never actually think about it as a philosophy of life. They just absorb it from their parents, from their teachers, from their professors, from their friends, from the culture at large. And they live. But they don't have anything explicit. They don't have specific ideas to help them guide themselves through life. In some sense, what happens to them is somewhat accidental. They don't think it through. They don't articulate for themselves. And they never know, because they don't think it through, whether they're on the right path or on the wrong path, whether they have the right philosophy, the right ideas, are the wrong ideas. They just passively absorb it. So my first recommendation to end everybody, again, particularly if you're young, is don't let that happen to you. Whatever set of ideas you choose in life, choose them. Be conscious of them. Decide that they are right for you, that you want to live by that set of ideas. And that's what Ayn Rand did for me. That's what Atlas Shrugged did for me. It's articulated a set of ideas, and initially, as I was reading Atlas Shrugged, I wasn't convinced. But it made clear that I had to make a choice. I had to decide. I had to articulate for myself what kind of life I wanted to live. And of course, by the end of the book, I was convinced that who I was right, and I guess 40 years later I still am convinced. Um, but again, whether you agree with Ayn Rand or not, I encourage you to use the opportunity of reading Atlas Shrugged to go through this process of thinking, what is my life about, what am I living for, and how should I live it? And make it yours. Make it your choices, 
your decisions rather than just absorbing what the culture feeds you. Because most cultures are not very good. So you're absorbing a lot of not very good ideas. Because most cultures are not very good because most people don't think about the ideas that they get. And this has been going on for hundreds of years, so a lot of, a lot of not thinking has gone on. Now, Ayn Rand presents us with a very specific set of ideas about our personal lives. And the first most important question she asks is what should you live for? What is morality? What is ethics? What is the right code by which one should live? Ethics and morality are code for living your life. It's a code of values to make important decisions in life. So she asks every one of us to think about and choose what is the code of ethics? What are the principles by which we're going to live? And if you look at the world around you, if you look at what our culture tells us we should live by, it tells us that we should live our lives for the sake of other people. That the standard for morality is not our own good, but the good of others. That what virtue is, what goodness is, is being selfless. The culture tells us that goodness, morality, virtue is about self-sacrifice. It's about denial of self. And, and, and you see this, you see this everywhere, from religion to secular philosophy. I mean, when I was little, my mother taught me, I mean, good Jewish mother. Think of yourself last. Think of others first. Be selfless. Sacrifice is good. Sacrifice is noble. And this is, this is everywhere in the culture. We're urged to sacrifice for the common good, for the public interest, for the state, for the country, for your neighbors, for your friends, for, for anybody but yourself. The idea is to live for the sake of others. That's what morality has been, that's what morality is, almost forever. So, if you're an entrepreneur, if you're very successful in business, you should feel guilty. And most entrepreneurs, and most successful people, at least the people I know in America, do feel guilty. Why do they feel guilty? Because all their lives they've done, because to be successful, this is what you have to do, they've kind of followed their own interests. They've done what they passionately believe in. They've made money, God forbid, right? They've made money. I mean, if you think about, I like to use my iPhone, if you think about Steve Jobs, right? Why does he make this? To make money. A lot of money in this. Profit margins, very high. But it's not just money. What else is it? He, what's that? Idea. idea. He loves this, right? This is his idea, his value, his passion. He loves to make beautiful things. Love, unfortunately, he's not around anymore. But this is about Steve Jobs. He doesn't care about me. He doesn't care about you. He cares about Steve. He happened to make something beautiful that's good for me and good for you. But he made it for himself. And he helped me, and he helped you, and he made the world a better place. But that doesn't count, because at the same time he made money for himself, and he enjoyed it. So a culture tells him, okay, that's okay, but you have to feel guilty about it. You have to redeem yourself. And how does he redeem himself? Well, Steve Jobs is not around, but let's say Bill Gates, how does Bill Gates redeem himself? He starts a foundation, and he starts giving his money away quickly. It's like buying himself into heaven. And now we think he's a good guy. Now he's wonderful. Is he changing the world? Not really. Not like he did at Microsoft. But now he's a good guy because he's not benefiting. Because we don't like self-interest. So, now, 
you know, Bill Gates, we still don't like that much, right? Because while he's giving his money away, he's still rich. He still lives in a big house. And the worst thing of all is he looks like he's enjoying it. And you can't be a really moral, virtuous person if you're having fun. Right? When was the last painting you saw of a saint who was smiling? Saints always have arrows in them. and they're... So if you want Bill Gates to be a saint, what would he have to do? Yeah, he'd have to give all his money away, move into a tent, and bleed a little bit. Then we'd name streets after him. We'd build statues for him. None of us would want to be him, but that's a whole different thing, right? We'd still admire him like we admire Mother Teresa. Who wants to be Mother Teresa? Nobody. But we, you know, the statues, and, you know, she's a saint. Ayn Rand asked a simple question. Why? Why should I live for other people? Why should I sacrifice? Why should I be selfless? Why is their life more important than mine? Why is not creating and building and making more important than giving? After all, you can't give until you create and make. Isn't the creating more important? Isn't what Bill Gates did at Microsoft and what Steve Jobs did at Apple virtuous and good? Why don't they get statues for that? So she asks this question of why, and there is no answer. Because my life, to me, is much more important than your lives are. And your lives are more important to you than my life should be. That's a fact of nature. I only have one shot at this. I don't live it in your body, I live it in mine. My life is the most important thing to me. There's nothing more important than it. So for Ayn Rand, the question is not, how should I sacrifice? How should I live for others? What's, how do I do things for other people? It's how do I make my life the best life that I can live? How do I take the hundred years that I'm on this planet? You guys are young, so you've probably got a hundred years. I don't know about me. How do I take that time and make the most of it? Live the best life that I can live. Achieve happiness and fulfillment. Live, live a life worthy of a human being with everything that we as human beings are capable of. And not to suffer and bleed and give, but to make and create and thrive. And that's the message of Atlas Shrugged. It's take your life and make the most of it. Live, live. And the question is, and the question morality and ethics as a science should answer, I don't know how many philosophy students they are here, but it should answer, because it doesn't, it's not how they teach morality in philosophy today, but what morality and ethics should teach us is how to live. Because it's not obvious, it's not easy. There are a thousand different poles in, in, in different directions. The things that are motivating us. What's, what is a good path and what is a bad path? What should I do? What shouldn't I do? What should be the principles that guide me to what's good and, and avoid what's evil and what's bad? That's a science. And, and this particular observation is not necessarily new to Ayn Rand. Aristotle, the great Greek philosopher, had the same kind of project in ethics. His goal of his ethics is to achieve eudaimonia, which is flourishing or happiness for the individual. And he says, there's one road that leads to a successful life, and there are many roads that lead to an unsuccessful life. And you have to figure out what the road is. And, and this is exactly what Ayn Rand is proposing. So she's proposing values and virtues that help us achieve success in living. Now, what are those? I don't have time to go over all of them, but I just want to give an indication of the most important of them. What is the most important value that should guide our lives? That's objectively the most important value 
for every human being. Time. What's that? Time. Time? Time, I can't control time, unfortunately. Time is what it is. The human being itself? Well, but what is what makes possible for the human being itself? What makes possible every value, every value that we have? What what makes possible for us to take advantage of time, to, 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 to utilize time better? What makes possible this building and these lights and the fact that you've got a university and a projector and do you see this tiny little camera? That's pretty cool. Um, what makes possible these things? I mean, we're a unique animal, right? Unique, but, but somewhat pathetic. I mean, just look around the room. That's a joke, but anyway. <laughs> um, we're weak. We're slow. We have no fangs. We have no claws. You go out there into nature and try to run down your food. We can't. What do we do? We have to build, we have to make tools, we have to have strategies, we have to have, we have to hunt, we have to build traps. We have to think. Everything is about thinking. Every product that is ever being made by human beings is a product of human reason, of human thought. We had to figure out how to build a trap. We have to figure out how to build, who has a gene for making weapons? Which would be useful in Ukraine right now, but I don't think you have that gene. Nobody has a gene for building weapons. We don't have a gene. You know how to make clothes? Anybody know how to make clothes? I don't know how to make clothes. I, I certainly not ingrained in me. I'd have to figure it out. How to skin an animal, how to dry the pelt, how to cut it up and shape it into, I don't know how to do it. Or take cotton and weave it. All of that some genius had to think of at some point. Agriculture, we don't know how to do agriculture until somebody figures it out. So the thing that makes human possible, human life possible, advancements in human life possible, is reason. For Ayn Rand, everything is about thinking, it's about reasoning, it's about figuring out what's good, what's not good, what's the right path, what isn't the right path, and the people who use their mind consistently are her heroes. Think about Atlas Shrugged. Most of you have read it. Think about Reardon figuring out Reardon Metal, spending hours testing, trying, failing over and over and over again. For eight years, it takes him to develop the metal. And it's all a product up here, it's all thinking. And that's what makes him heroic. He's struggling against nature and he beats it. He figures out how to make something new that didn't exist before. That's his heroism. It's the fact that he's using his mind to better his own life and by doing that, bettering all of our lives. That's what Steve Jobs did. That's what Bill Gates did. They are heroes. Not because they give money away. Not even because they make our lives better, although that's a nice plus. It's because they make their own lives better. And because they do it by using the tool that is uniquely human, which is the human mind. Do you know what the theme, what Ayn Rand said the theme of Atlas Shrugged was? The theme of Atlas Shrugged, the meaning of Atlas Shrugged, the message of Atlas Shrugged, is the role of the mind in human life. Because what is the strike, and if you haven't read the book, you know, plug your ears. What is the strike, a strike of? Who goes on strike? The people who are using their minds. And when they go on strike, what happens to the rest of society? Collapses. It collapses. Because without the mind, there is no society. There is no economy. There is no economic growth. There is no economic success. There is no economic progress. There is no life. So before we get into the political, the essence of Atlas Shrug for an individual is use your mind to live the best life that you can live. Be rationally long-term self-interested. The way to be self-interested is to be rational and long-term. 
all the other virtues that Iron Man talks about, honesty and integrity and justice and pride and independence and so on, are all just applications of the idea of rationality to different parts of your life. Why be honest, for example, we'll just do honesty quickly. Why should you be honest? Why should you? Because honesty is about facts. And reason and rationality demands facts. There's a, uh, there's a expression in computers, and hopefully you can translate this uh, easily. Garbage in, garbage out. Garbage in, garbage out. If you put garbage into a computer, you get garbage out, right? If you put garbage into your mind, you get garbage out. Not good, not rational, not reason. The reason, to be honest, is you want good stuff going in. You want the truth. You want facts. And that's true to yourself, but that's also true in your relationship to other people. You want relationships based on Facts, not on fantasy, not on lies, not on pretend, but on truth, on reality, on facts. And when you don't live that kind of life, what happens to people who lie? Anybody here ever lie? I don't really want to know. Um, it's stupid. It doesn't work. Lying usually leads to more lying. It's usually not one lie, right? It's usually a series of lies. You usually get caught, which is not good, not in personal life, not in business. But even if you don't get caught, there's now whoever you like to, there's not a barrier. There's, there's something that is unpleasant, that is wrong, that doesn't work. It makes you feel bad because you can't really communicate with the other person. Right? I mean, try this as an experiment. Take somebody you really, really, really like and spend a couple of days lying to them and see how that works. Or go into business and try lying through a couple of days in your business. Lying is unbelievably self-destructive. It's bad for you. It's not rational. That's why it's wrong, according to Ayn Rand. Because it's not good for you. So for Rand, you should be self-interested, neither sacrificing yourself to other people, but also not asking other people to sacrifice themselves to you. Be independent. Live for yourself. Now, what kind of world does somebody who's independent, who thinks to himself, who wants to pursue his own life, who thinks long-term, what kind of world does a person like that want to live in? What kind of world does he need to live in? If reason is your standard, if reason is where all values come from, what is the enemy of reason? What makes reason impotent? Somebody said something. Restrictions. And I would, I would phrase it a little bit, a little bit differently because there are all kinds of restrictions. Coercive restrictions. Coercion, force, is the enemy of the mind. If I put a gun to the back of your head and tell you from now on you have to act as if 2 plus 2 equals 5, try building a bridge. Try programming a computer. There's very little you can do with this once you have a gun at the back of your head. Coercion. Restriction, forced restriction of any kind, restrict the human mind. When people are afraid to express themselves because they might go to jail because of their ideas, they think less about the ideas. Because if I can't express the ideas, what's the point of thinking about them? If certain products that I make need some government regulator's permission, then I'm less likely to make the product because who the hell is he? The more restrictions, the more coercion, the more force in society, the less thinking in society. So if we value reason, 
And if we, each one of us, value our own lives, then what kind of society do we want to live in? In a society in which there's no coercion, in which we are free. Now, freedom is a word that everybody throws out there, and nobody ever tells you what it means. Right? Left, right, center, the most authoritarian government in the world, they're all for freedom. Nobody's ever against freedom. So what does freedom mean? It means no coercion. It means no force. It means the ability to do whatever the hell you want to do. As long as you're not hurting other people. As long as you're not violating this right to think and to act on their own behalf. It means following, pursuing your reason, right or wrong, in pursuit of your values. That's what freedom means. And that's what the idea of individual rights means. Individual rights means freedom to act in the pursuit of your values. Nobody has a right to stop you. Nobody has a right to limit you, to restrict you, to tell you that's not allowed. So Ayn Rand says, so Ayn Rand politically advocates for a political system of freedom. A political system in which the men of the mind, all types from industrialists to artists to authors, to, can think and produce and act and do what they believe is in the best day long-term, rational, best interest. And the only such system that's ever come about in human history is the system of capitalism. It's the system that the founding fathers of America tried to create. It's a logic that did create. It's a system where government is limited to protecting us instead of being allowed to coerce us, to protecting our rights, our property rights, our right to action, our right to live, our right to think, our right to pursue happiness, and otherwise leaves us alone. That's freedom. Freedom is not replacing one authoritarian government with another authoritarian government. But the one authoritarian government happens to be, I don't know, my ethnic group and not the other people person's ethnic group. Hey, how, many of you, how many of you have seen Braveheart? Anybody seen Braveheart, the movie? Oh, too, too few to use as an example. Oh, maybe a few more. So in Braveheart, the Scottish, you know, they're fighting for freedom. But what does it mean? Nothing. It means we want to be ruled by a Scottish king, not an English king. Who cares? He's a king. So freedom means freedom of the individual to act on his own behalf. And the only system of government ever to recognize that was the original American system of government. And that is the original system of government which implicitly at the shrug is advocating for. It's advocating for freedom for producers, freedom for creators, freedom for builders, freedom for individuals to live their life as they see fit. Without mother government telling them what they can and cannot do, without mother government inspecting them, regulating them, controlling them. So from an individual's perspective, Atlas Shrugged, there's a book about living your life to the fullest, about taking advantage of all the potential that is within you. It's about committing yourself to the pursuit of your own happiness, committing yourself to your own flourishing, to your own success as a human being. For a political system, Atlas Shrugged is a book about creating a political system that allows every one of us to pursue his own happiness. To exercise your own reason in the pursuit of the values you think are necessary for your life. So Alice Shrug, 
is very unique in a sense. Because not only is it a great story, an exciting story, but it has this profound philosophical message that has implications for each one of our lives and for the political system we live under. I don't know of any other book that has anything close to that. Um, and certainly no other book that presents this specific philosophy. So I encourage those of you who haven't read the book yet to read it. I know it's long, but it's worth it. Those of you who have read it, it's, it's always good once in a while to read it again. Maybe in 10 years or so, have, after some experience in life, uh, people I know who read it every few decades, you get something different out of it because your experiences now are different. But more importantly than reading it, again, I encourage you to take the idea seriously and to think about this. Read some of Ayn Rand's nonfiction, particularly The Virtue of Selfishness and Capitalism, Thy Own Ideal. I don't know if they're translated in Ukrainian, but if not, that's a project worth doing. So they will be, I'm told. And apply them. Live your life based on these principles. As I said in the beginning, you got one shot at this. We all have one shot, one attempt at living. Make the most of it. Achieve happiness. Do what you believe rationally is really in your own long-term self-interest. Pursue your own happiness and help create a political system that allows everybody to pursue their own happiness. Thank you all. All right, we've got plenty of time for questions. So, in English or in Ukrainian, yep. Uh, thank you for your speech. I just, uh, I'm a supporter of Ayn Rand's ideas, but uh, I've been wondering why Ayn Rand's philosophy has so far failed to enter mainstream philosophy. And maybe you have an explanation for that. I've heard this critique that basically one of the reasons is that and Rand supporters uh, have so far failed to to use uh, like a rigorous scientific apparatus to you know to write like very like fundamental lengthy books. Yep. And that that scientists, philosophers, professional philosophers would take seriously. Okay. So the question is, why hasn't I, why haven't Ayn Rand's ideas entered into mainstream philosophy? Why aren't they discussed in philosophy departments? Why aren't they part of the philosophy curriculum? Why aren't they engaged in the philosophy journals? And, and one explanation for that, that people, usually existing philosophers, uh, articulate, is that we, those who defend Ayn Rand's philosophy, have failed to articulate the philosophy in scientific, philosophical, detailed way, in a kind of way that philosophy if philosophy is dealt with in the language of, if you will, contemporary philosophy. So, so let me let me let me let me let me say a few things about this. One, I mean, let me just try and explain why I think Ayn Rand's philosophy hasn't entered mainstream philosophy, which I don't think that's the reason. But I think the reason is it's a revolutionary. In many ways, Ayn Rand's philosophy turns philosophy on its head. It turns it upside down. It challenges. 2,000 years of philosophical thinking. Now, there were good philosophers over the last 2,000 years. I'm not saying there weren't. But Ayn Rand challenges every single one of them on some pretty substantial issues. Uh, she considered herself really, you know, in a sense, a, uh, an heir to Aristotle, to Aristotle's uh, thinking. And Aristotle's ideas, qua real philosophical ideas, qua a system of ideas, are not particularly popular in academic philosophy. I mean, people study Aristotle, but they don't study Aristotle from the perspective of these are true ideas. They study, they, 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 they do technical analysis of what he did or didn't write. Um, but she challenges, she challenges the, the conventional moral views, which are all altruistic in one way or another or egalitarian, which is just a form of, of altruism. She challenges much of the metaphysics and the epistemology, particularly post-Kant. And as a consequence of all that, she challenges the politics. Now, what about 
rigorous analytical writing on uh, Ayn Rand's ideas. First of all, such writings do exist, but they're being ignored as well. Uh, whether it's Leonard Peikoff's uh, Objectives on the Philosophy of Ayn Rand or, or the, uh, the analytic synthetic dichotomy that he wrote an essay about, which is pretty technical and addresses technical philosophical issues. They're still ignored by conventional philosophers. And I think, again, they're ignored because not only are Ayn Rand's conclusions different than the way philosophers look at the world today, but her methodology is different. And I think it's going to be a long time, unfortunately, decades probably, before academic philosophers accept her methodology, which is much more reality-oriented. But you see, Immanuel Kant, and I'm, I'm not going to get too technical with you guys, but Immanuel Kant severed human reason from reality. And we've never recovered since. So it's hard to talk for philosophers if they don't quite accept that what we observe with our senses is reality as it is. And therefore, all of Ayn Rand's conclusions that come from observation, from observation of a reality she believes is real. If you don't believe that, there's nothing to talk about. And that's part of the problem with it's hard to have a conversation with a conventional philosopher because almost all of them are Kantians. Um, and let me, so one more point and that's it. Um, but things are changing. So in America today, at the University of Texas in Austin, in the philosophy department, there is a chair in the study of Ayn Rand, a chair in the study of objectivism, the name of her philosophy. That didn't exist 20 years ago, so that's new. There are fellowships for the study of objectivism in a number of universities around the United States, often in philosophy departments. At Rutgers University, which is the number one or number two philosophy department in the world, they are now going to have an annual conference studying Ayn Rand's ideas, where academic philosophers will come in to discuss, agree or disagree, but to discuss them. So the beginnings of that change of her ideas entering into the world of academic philosophy is happening as we speak, but it's going to take a long time. Yes. Uh, Brooks, I have a question to you. Uh, do you agree that uh, the society uh, described as a certain part of the book uh, may be called a kind of capitalistic uh, utopia, so a kind of ideal society, but not uh, socialistic as both of other utopias are, but not capitalistic? So do I think that the uh, society described at the end of Atlas Shrugged Gulch Gulch, uh, is a, a capitalist utopia. Not a socialist utopia, but still a utopia as an ideal. I think utopia is a dangerous word. Um, and I, I agree with ideal, but I don't agree with utopia. So I think it's an ideal. But even Gulch Gulch is not a society. Gulch Gulch is a small group of friends who are living together. Ayn Rand never said that that's how a society would look like. It's, it's something within a society, right? For example, Gold Scouts has no government, but Ayn Rand was a strong believer in government. She was not an anarchist, right? So Gold Scouts is some ideal of how human beings should interact and the, the, the criteria by which they should live, but not as a full-blown society. Ayn Rand never wrote us a model of that. that you'll have to write the sequel to Atlas Shrugged, which presents that ideal society fully worked out. Uh, utopia implies something that can never really be achieved. I believe that the world of Ayn Rand, because her philosophy is derived from reality, can be achieved in reality. So I'm an idealist in the sense that I believe ideals can manifest in reality, can exist in reality, can come about. It's going to take a long time, right? I will never see it. I won't see it in my lifetime. I don't know that you'll see it in your lifetime, but it will happen someday. Because the truth, I think, wins out in the end. And I think Ayn Rand's vision for us is a true vision. Yeah. Uh, I suppose you travel a lot all around the world. And I would like you to ask whether you can name the countries that succeeded more in following the Iron Rain ideas, except the United States. <laughs> so, 
So no country has succeeded in following Ayn Rand's ideas, qua Ayn Rand's ideas, because of course the United States, which is the most capitalist country in history, came before Ayn Rand, right? And part of Ayn Rand's ideas were developed by looking at the experience of America and saying what's good, what's not good, right? And how do I abstract away the principles that made America successful? and form a philosophy around that, and next time we try America, let's get it right, right? Because the founders got a few things wrong. Slavery, for example. Um, so the question, I would rephrase the question. I would say, what country in the world is most capitalist or most free? I think is a, is a fairer question to ask. And, and I, think it's, I think it's very difficult to say, because some countries have a lot of economic freedom, but very little political freedom. Singapore is a good example. Lots of economic freedom. Contract law is respected. As an entrepreneur, you can pretty much do anything you want. Easy to start a business. Huge amount of wealth. People are very wealthy in, in Singapore. Average GDP is very high per capita. And, and you're free economically in business. Wonderful business environment. But you don't want to speak against the government. You don't want to chew gum in the streets. Right? I don't know, there's a famous case where somebody threw his gum on the floor in the streets of Singapore and they got caned, whipped, right? Okay, so how do you free in some regards, not free in others? Um, you know, people compare uh, the United States, and people love to compare the United States and Sweden and Scandinavia, right? And they say Scandinavia is socialism and America's capitalism. Look, socialism works fine. Neither one of those statements is right. The United States is not capitalist. It's got lots of regulations, lots of controls, more and more every year. It's far from capitalist. And Sweden is not socialist. Indeed, in many ways, Sweden has more economic freedom than Americans do. It's easier to run a bank. In many businesses, there's more freedom in Sweden than there is in America. Taxes are higher in Sweden. So, but on the other hand, in Sweden, you don't have protection for free speech. They have hate speech laws. I don't know if you have hate speech laws in the Ukraine. Do you have hate speech laws? You do? No, really? I don't know. Okay, you guys can argue about it later. Really, really bad thing to have hate speech laws. Um, America doesn't have that, so that's a good thing. So, there are all these things that a balance and it's hard to figure out. Now, but if you had to push me on which one is the freest, I would say Hong Kong. Because Hong Kong, at least as long as the Chinese led it, it has incredible economic freedom. Uh, you can do pretty much anything you want from an economic perspective. Again, as long as you're not hurting other people. Great respect for property rights, great respect for contract, a real independent judiciary it's weakening now because of the Chinese influence, so it's less independent than it used to be, but relatively independent judiciary, which is the key to the rule of law, which is what you guys need in Ukraine. A completely independent judiciary, not influenced by political pressure. Right? And at the same time, you also have free speech, you can demonstrate, you, can, uh, you, can't, you don't vote, right? So the only thing you don't have in account is voting. I don't think voting is the most important thing in the world. I mean, I'm going to vote next year in the American election. I'll have two losers to choose between. I don't know, Hillary Clinton and some Republican loser. I'd rather have Hong Kong freedom than the choice between those two. So, it's not perfect. I mean, I'd like them to be able to vote, at least on certain things. But in California, for example, we vote on everything. So they want to raise taxes, everybody votes. We all vote, they have referendums. So we all vote. So guess what? Uh, you have referendums to increase taxes on the rich. How does everybody vote? Absolutely, yes. Because most people are not rich. But what's really interesting, which relates to my point is, how do you think the rich people vote? Do you think rich people vote to raise their taxes or lower their taxes? Raise their taxes. Rich people always vote to raise their taxes. So when Obama ran for president last time, he promised to raise taxes on rich people. Eight of the ten richest counties in America voted for Obama. 
In California, we raise taxes on rich people, just the state tax from 10% to 13%. Huge increase, 30%. Rich people voted for raising their own taxes. Why? Because they feel guilty. They've made all this money. They've been all successful. They're happy, God forbid. They have to pay a price. So the politicians say, you're happy. You made a lot of money. Look over there. You know, if, if you don't, if we don't raise your taxes, we're going to have to cut education spending. We're going to have to cut welfare. We're gonna, and it's going to be your fault. And they feel guilty, so they pay up. So they increase their taxes. So I say Hong Kong. It used, oh, the other one I love uh, is New Zealand. And, and I love New Zealand primarily because it's just beautiful. A anybody see Lord of the Rings movies? <laughs> That's what New Zealand looks like. Those mountains and forests, that's New Zealand. But it's also pretty economically free. Again, not like Hong Kong, but fairly free. And they speak, you know, I like it because they speak English and it's beautiful. Yeah. I think I also that the country in the state should be separated the same way as George's state. Yes. So would you imagine that, like, explaining this? Yes, so Ayn Rand once said, that economics and the state should be separated, just like church and state should be separated, and for the same reasons. Now, why should, why should church and state be separated? Why should the state not have a religion? Or I would even make it broader. Why should the state not have ideas? The state should not have ideas. In my view, the state shouldn't be socialist, it shouldn't be any ism. Because that separates people inside. Yeah. yeah, because as soon as the state has ideas, it means that those ideas have coercive power behind them. They're going to coerce you. If the state is Protestant, it's going to impose Protestantism. Otherwise, what does it mean for the state to be Protestant? If the state believes in... Um, I don't know. A, a, a certain view of education is a good example, right? Progressive education, James Dewey education, then it's going to impose that education. Whatever the state believes, it is an instrument of force. That's what the state is. The state is a gun. Every time you think government, think gun. Big gun, actually. So, ideas and guns have no business together. The whole point of the gun is to protect us so that we can have ideas. Some of the ideas will be wrong. The same with economics. Economics is action, is how we act in an economic context. There's no role for coercion in how we act. How we act economically is a reflection of certain ideas that we have. The state has no role in that because coercion has no role in it. So what Ayn Rand believed is that this, our economic lives, we should be free of coercion. We should be free of force. We should be free of being told what to do. And again, as long as we're not hurting other people, the state has no business because the state is a gun. So the state should have no economic policy. The state shouldn't print money. It shouldn't have a central bank. It should have no energy policy. It should have no education policy. It should have no scientific policy. It should have a policy about protecting us, defending us, and leaving us alone. So that in education, different people can offer different products and different ideas. And you can, some of them might be rotten, but you get to choose, not some bureaucrat. Just like you get to choose between Apple and Samsung. What's pretty amazing is they both are really, really good. Why? Well, imagine if a state bureaucracy made this. It would be the size of that wall. You couldn't, it would never work. I mean, but they couldn't even imagine it. This could never come about. So imagine, for example, if the state got out of education. Actually, we can imagine. Some of us still remember the times of Soviet Union. Yeah, you might remember Soviet cause, right? 
you might remember some of the products and goods that were produced by communism. That's the state. So you want the state separated from production because that separates them from thinking, that separates them from human decision. And by the way, and then I'll take the question over there. Yeah, let me just make one more point. If you want to be a communist under capitalism, that's fine. You can get your friends together and go live in a commune. Nobody has the right to force you not to be there. You can each provide according to your ability and each consume according to your need. And as long as nobody's using force against anybody else, you can have a commune. That's the beauty of capitalism. You can be a socialist. You can be whatever you want. As long as you're not coercing, that's fine. And if communism is such a great idea, it would succeed under capitalism. But it's a lousy idea. That's why communists need force. Capitalism is a great idea. That's why we can just leave you alone. And we believe that you'll all be good capitalists. But again, if you don't want to be, that's fine. Just find another, another people who agree with you and go and start a kibbutz, if you know, in Israel. Of course, the kibbutz never survived, right? The kibbutz has only survived because they were subsidized by the government, which means they only survived by coercion. Somebody coerced some people who were very productive to pay for the kibbutz. But if they weren't subsidized and you want to live in a kibbutz, all the power to you. I think it's stupid, but... You know. Yeah. There is one question. You mentioned that one has to live with oneself. I think about your own virtue and your own targets. So why do they come here and keep telling all this to ourselves? Because I love telling you all. I'm enjoying myself right now. This is fun for me. If I, if I stood up here on the stage and hated this, I wouldn't do it. I love teaching. I'm a teacher. That's what I love to do. I love that other people gain an understanding of what I'm saying. That is the value I get from you. It's the understanding. And, you know, I used to teach finance. And I enjoyed that. So it's not even just about philosophical ideas. I, I enjoyed the process of communication, of teaching, of knowledge, of gaining knowledge, and conveying knowledge. Those are my values. That's what I love to do. Some people don't love this. They get all, you know, it's just not enjoyable. Then I wouldn't do it. I'm not going to say, go... Teach objectivism to the world because it's your duty. Ayn Rand assigned you the duty. No, I don't feel it's a duty. If I didn't enjoy it, I wouldn't do it. I also, for my own selfish desire, want to live in a freer world. I want to see freedom happen. And if it happens in Ukraine, great. I don't care where it happens. I want to see it. And I'm willing to go around the world and plant seeds. And I hope that some of them results in freedom. And if I get to see that in my lifetime, I'll be very happy. It'll make all of this worthwhile. But I also enjoy the process, but it'll make it even. Now, I also have children. So here's another. I'm giving you all the selfish reasons. I also have children. I want them to live in a freer world. I'm fighting and I love them. It's not that it's altruism. I love my children. They're a value to me. I want them. I want to die knowing that they will live in a freer world than I did. So I go around the world trying to make it freer for my kids. But there's another element. I really, really enjoy watching successful people. Happy people. People who live life. Heroes. I love Steve Jobs. I mean, even though certain aspects of a personal life are all screwed up, I love iPhones. I, you know, I've got an Apple Watch. I, you know, I, I'm just, I love this stuff. And if some of you, because of my talk, 
Take your life more seriously. Live a more purposeful life. Achieve great things. That makes me incredibly happy because I, I get to see that. I get to see it. And I get to enjoy it through the products you make, through the ideas you might have, through the music you might compose, through the paintings you might paint. To whatever productive activity you choose, I benefit from it. I mean, th this is kind of an important economic point. When other people produce and make a lot of money, I'm better off. I love rich people. Assuming they got rich by producing stuff, by making stuff. Because it means that they produced stuff and made stuff that made my life better. I use Google every day. I love the fact that the guys at Google are billionaires. Because my life is better because they're billionaires. If they weren't billionaires, we wouldn't have Google. I mean, the two are related. You can only become rich in a free society by creating values that lots and lots and lots of other people benefit from. So if I can help any of you become super rich by making my life better, I'm cool with it. And that's why I give my speech. Thank you. Yeah, second question. Sounds like a really hard question. <laughs> <laughs> I understood Jack London and Steinbeck. That's what I got. No. What are the great tragedies of uh, human history? Is that the intellectuals and the authors and the literary figures of the late 19th century and early 20th century How can I be nice about this? Um, had no clue about what was going on in their world, had no clue about the benefits of capitalism, had no clue about human history and what it took for human beings to survive. Now, Jack London is a fabulous author. I enjoy reading him. But he has no clue about the Industrial Revolution. And he mischaracterizes it, and indeed he mischaracterizes human psychology and human reason. I don't, I, the second book I haven't read, the third book by Steinbeck, I mean, Steinbeck is living in the greatest country in human history, the wealthiest country in human history, and all he can do is aspire to a socialist utopia which would make everybody equally poor and would destroy everything that was created in the country that he's living in. I mean, Steinbeck is a tragedy that is such a great writer, has such a lousy philosophy. And The Grapes of Wrath is, again, it's, it's, it's a misrepresentation of the causes of the Great Depression, which you are then... So now overproduction. Let's get to overproduction. We'll, I'll get to you. Let me finish the question. Overproduction. There's no such thing as overproduction. There's no such thing as, it's never happened in all of human history unless government does it. So in the United States before the financial crisis, there was overproduction of housing. Why? Because the government was subsidizing it. In a marketplace, there's never overproduction. Because what happens if you produce too much? What happens to the price? It goes down which clears the inventory out, and what do you do? Do you produce more if it goes down and you're losing money? No, you go out of business. Has anybody in the audience ever had a problem to consume stuff? 
If I gave you a bunch of money, do, would you have a problem buying stuff with it? No. No. Nobody ever has a problem with consumption. You know when you have a problem with consumption? When I'm afraid that I won't have a job in the future. When I'm afraid that my, my, that, that the future is uncertain. A fear created by government, not a fear created in the marketplace. And then I stick the money in the mattress. But nobody in a free market ever sticks their money in the mattress. Nobody hoards. Hoarding is, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a fiction created by Marx and Keynes. And doesn't exist in a free market. Because what do you do if you have lots of money and you finish consuming? What do you do with the rest of it? You, you invest it. And what does investment do? Make more money. Well, it makes more money, but to make more money, what does it have to do? Produce. It has to produce. It creates jobs, which means it creates more consumption and more production. And if you don't directly invest it, you put it in the bank. What does the bank do with the money? It lends it to people to either consume or produce. Money is never idle. Money doesn't just sit there, ever. Unless you're so afraid of government policy that you're not going to invest, you're not going to give it to them, the bank won't give it out as loans, and it sits in the vaults of the Federal Reserve like it is right now. But that's because of government-created uncertainty. So the whole liquidity trap, the whole story that Keynes tells is to be polite nonsense. And, and uh, Hayek proved him wrong back in the 30s. But nobody listened to Hayek. It's about time they started listening uh, to free market economists like Hayek and von Mises and stopped listening to Marx and Keynes because they're wrong. And, and there's never been an example of it. There was no overproduction in the Great Depression. There just wasn't. There was no underconsumption in the Great Depression. What there was, was massive stupidity on the part of government. Horrible policies that created the Great Depression. Uh, and the whole, the whole books, by the way, the time. Do we have ten more minutes? I've got two more questions. Two oh, more? She had a question and this kid, this guy had Sorry, sorry, but I, I just, I'm only one man who, is, who should be more disciplined than others. So when do we have to leave? Yeah, okay. I have one question about... Uh, Make the questions really short. Okay. Uh, why did you choose finance and what was the theme of the solution? Why did I choose finance? Um, I, I, by accident. Um, my life is a series of accidents. I, I was an engineer, but I wanted to get to the United States, one of the consequences of reading Adam Shrug. So I, I, I wanted, so studying was the way to do it. And what I liked about engineering was the management side of it. So I went to get an MBA. So I got an MBA. And when I did MBA, I took finance classes and really liked them. And my finance professors liked me, so they convinced me to get a PhD in finance. And I, I enjoyed it. So I got, uh, I got a PhD in finance because I enjoyed the, the, math, the, the combination of math and practicality. And, and my, my research ideas uh, my research was mainly in corporate governance and primarily focused on banking. And today, I actually am a, am a part manager of a hedge fund that invests in banks, long, short banks in the United States. And that's how I make a little bit of money. He had a question, and then, okay, these two, but short ones, okay, short ones. So, today you've already met members of Ukrainian parliament. Yeah. And I wonder what you do. No, I, I, I told them. I told them to do. They asked me three things they should do right away. I said privatize to anybody at any cost, including foreigners. Open the borders up. Let capital flow in. Sell it to the Germans. Anybody but the Russians, I guess. But sell it to anybody who wants to buy it. Privatize everything. Everything under the sun in, in Ukraine should be in private hands. Second, I said. Deregulate, get the government out of the business of business. Just eliminate regulations across the board. Third, a, a flat tax that, you know, that get rid of that, get rid of sales taxes, get rid of all, have one flat income and uh, corporate tax, just a flat tax. And then I said, uh, there should be no 
that the Ukrainian government should have no, that they didn't like this, but they should have no Department of Energy, no Department of Commerce, no Department of Business Relations. They should just free those sectors up. So if you're worried about energy, privatize it. That'll get entrepreneurs. That'll get capital. That's the solution. Not government policy to decide, oh, we should have... We, we had a whole discussion on wind farms and solar energy, which, which I'm against, so, which I think is inefficient and unproductive. Okay. Yeah, then that's the short one. Yeah, yeah, so far you've got only two uncomfortable questions. And yeah. I, I know that you gave a speech in Russia not so far. Yes. Not so long ago. So how two many, days ago. How many uncomfortable questions did they ask you there? How many uncomfortable questions they asked me in Russia? Well, let me give you an example of one uncomfortable question they asked me. They asked me what I think of, what I think of Putin. <laughs> and, and I had to think about, I need to leave the country. <laughs> but I told them what I thought of Putin, which was not very positive. So that was the most uncomfortable. And, and you could tell people in the audience were not, I mean, some were very supportive, but they were not comfortable even in supporting uh, what I said because, I mean, there's, there's this freedom of speech. It's, it's attention over it. 